but thankfully you're here. Let's go ahead and, and start with prayer. Father, thank you for the word of God today. Thank you for the exhortation. God, it's sin that, that's caused us. Uh, Lord, with that rift that's between you and us. Lord, it's not you who've done wrong. It's not you who've walked away. It's not you, God, who's uh, hurt our relationship, but it's us, God. It's our sin, and it's our pride that holds on to sin that, that's kept us from that full and wonderful relationship with you. God, you say, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, but sin is a reproach to any people. Father, I pray that we would be a holy people, a just people, a, a peculiar people, Lord, like you've called us to be. Father, bless tonight as, as Pastor Godfrey preaches. God, use yes. the singing, use the word of God to stir us up. Yes. God, we are uh, the army of the Lord. Lord, help us to do our part. Help us to be salt. Help us to be a light. Lord, stir up our hearts today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand to sing our theme song together, please. Jesus is my Savior, I shall not be moved. Turn to number nine, standing on the promises of God. All four verses, standing on the promises. Standing on the promises of Christ my Some of you in the chorus, you're singing that standing on the promises, that repeating those words. Keep that up together. It sounded wonderful from up here. Last verse. Standing on the promises. and maybe seated. Truth and righteousness, we've gone a 
Just keep on following God. So turn to number 193 in your songbook, All the Way My Savior Leads Me. I'm going to sing all three verses, please. 193. All the way my Savior leads me. Joy. 
announcements for us today. Uh, just a reminder, church-wide visitation at 10 o'clock. Before that, on Saturdays, we have our men's prayer meeting, sometimes a prayer breakfast, but not this week. 8 o'clock, we'll be meeting for prayer. Then 10 o'clock, we'll be going out for church-wide soul winning. And then a business meeting on August 22nd, Sunday night. An adult luncheon. There's a sign-up at the atrium there in the uh, Welcome Center. Um, 10.30 on August 31st, we're watching a sight and sound production. Please sign up by Wednesday the 25th, and then on September 1st, we're going to be starting up our youth programs again. Super excited about that. Um, so be praying, of course, for Masters Clubs and the teens Wednesday, September 1st um, at 645, starting that fall revival. And then also out at the Welcome Center, there is a sign-up sheet for our teen family night. So it's back there. So please sign up if you're, you're coming and how many you're bringing with you so that we can plan food accordingly. But we're going to have a great time. I was talking to some of the dads. I'm going to get those, what do we call those sticks? Po yeah, what are they called? Pugel sticks. And so it's going to be the, the adults versus the kids. And the adults are going to get to whoop up on their kids. And it's legal and it's fun. And it's going to be great, great time. So if you're a, a teen, a family member of a teen, please make... Um, Make plans to be there. That's 4 o'clock to 8 o'clock this Saturday. And then I do want to give you some updates from Pastor. Um, listen, the Bible says bodily exercise profiteth little. Uh, that's in the Bible. He, they were out hiking, and, and he uh, tweaked his knee just a little bit, so pray for him. Um, exercise is a terrible, terrible thing, <laughs> so stay away from it. It's dangerous. Um, and then also, Pastor wanted me to let you know about his mom's been in the hospital, or his mother-in-law's been in the hospital um, because of COVID, but being in the hospital, she's gotten better, and now his father-in-law has COVID, uh, so be praying for them as well. Ms. Sharon said, because I forgot the, the uh, offering earlier, we have to take a double offering tonight. <laughs> Just kidding. So men, if you'll come for the offering, that'd be great. Just proves. It's not the same without pastor, right? He doeth all things yeah. well. Amen. Brother Frank, you'll pray for us tonight, please. Yes, Father, we come to you at this time. Father, we thank you for preaching thy word this morning. Lord, pray whatever you lay on his heart tonight, mm -hmm. God, that you uh, go out with such power and boldness. And Father, Lord, if there's anyone lost tonight and do not know Christ as their Savior, I pray they come before too late. And Father, we thank you for what you plan to do. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen. amen.
Great truth. Amen. This is a time for our favorite. Since Brother Godfrey's here, we asked him for the favorite tonight. And I remember Jordan also has one coming, so that'll be next week. But uh, this week we're going to sing 232 in your songbooks, please. We don't have it up here because he just chose it. We couldn't type it up that fast. Trusting Jesus. Let's sing the first and last verses, 232. Simply trusting every day, trusting through a stormy way, even when my faith is small, trusting Jesus that is all, trusting as the moments fly, trusting as the Trusting 
Jesus, that is all. Seeing if my way is clear, praying if the path be drear, if in danger. For him, call trusting Jesus, that is all. Trusting him while life shall last, trusting him till earth be past, till within the Jasper wall, trusting Jesus. That is all simply trusting hear him call simply trusting Jesus that is all simply trusting Jesus that Well, Karen, we couldn't have planned that any better. What a sequel to the, the hymn we just sang. And we, no, we didn't get together. They just asked me to pick a song, and I picked 232, and she comes and sings a different arrangement, which was a real sequel to it. Wasn't that great? Good. So if you didn't get it, you ought to have it memorized by now. You've heard it twice. <laughs> Amen. Different, different version, but just uh, great. Well, it's been good to be with you today. Boy, we had a gully washer, didn't we? Well, God spared me because my wife wanted to go to Belk's and I was able to sit in the parking lot and she couldn't get in the store, so I was really protected. <laughs> now, that wasn't a sprinkle. That was a Baptist baptism. <laughs> How many inches did we get? Three or four? Nobody wants to commit themselves to it. Well, you're as good as the weatherman. He's usually wrong, so if your guess is as good as his, amen, amen. We're going to talk about and the song that the choir sang, you know, we need to stand up. You know, if we stand up for Jesus individually, uh, things will get pretty good for America, okay? We need to stand up for Jesus, and America will do great. Uh, open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to look at verses 10 through 17. You know, when you stand up for the Lord, and by the way, in this day and time, the contrast is so, is so stark, I mean, if you really stand up for Jesus, you, you stand out like a, a sore thumb. And the truth of the matter is we have so many mealy-mouthed Christians today that are straddling the fence. You don't know where they're standing. It, it's amazing. You know, uh, Christian, Christianity has been tried and failed. Uh, it hasn't been sufficiently tried. That's the problem. And we need to understand that, that uh, if, you, if you read your Bible, you'll have to be a, and you believe it, you'll have to be a conservative, and I mean that in the, in the truest sense, a fundamental Bible-believing believer, you, you, will be, you will be like a star shining in a dark place. I mean, who would have ever thought we would be just trying to decide what the genders were? There are only two and, you know, these people tell us to be careful about the coronavirus, and we need to be careful. I mean, it's, you know, they say believe the science. I say to the gender, gender engineers, believe the science. Yes. If a little baby boy is born, God's already determined his gender. Amen. If you can't believe what you can see, how are you going to believe a virus that you can't see? Amen. We need to stand up for Jesus. But you've got to be careful. When you stand up for Jesus, you could be misunderstood. It's like the preacher who thought he was taking a stand. He heard a commotion in the parking lot. And he was concerned, so he got up from his desk and went out, and there was three little boys 
And there was a little dog in the middle of them. And they were just going on and on and on. He walked out. He said, boys, what is the commotion out here? He said, well, you know, we found this stray dog and all of us want him. And so we decided the only way to settle this thing is who could tell the biggest lie. And we give him the dog. And, of course, the preacher became irate. He said, I can't believe that y'all would lie to get a dog. He said, that is unreal. He said, don't you know that lying is a sin? Yes. And he said, when I was your age, I never lied. And it got real quiet. And the youngest boy said, give him the dog. <laughs> he thought he was standing up for Jesus. Made him look bad. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10. Finally, my brother. You know, Paul is putting a period here, but he's saying, I've saved this for the last because this is the most important. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Why? For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in Washington, D.C., Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take in the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That's a well-equipped believer. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your blessings. Thank you for the Lord. Thank you, dear Lord, that we have something to stand for. And Father, I pray that you might help us to, Lord, not to be arrogant, not stand up because to be noticed, but Lord, may we stand up so you'll be noticed. And Father, I pray that you'd strengthen believers in this place. I especially pray for the young people that they might stand up in their youth and realize that they don't have to wait to a particular age to decide that they're going to stand up for you. And Lord, at every age level we have, we have a right and we have a privilege to stand for you. And Lord, may we make a difference where we live and understand it cooperatively as a local church here and then Lord, as a body of believers in this country, Lord, we can make a difference. And we'll ever praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to encourage you to stand up for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to especially speak to you young people. You need to stand up in your youth. It will make a difference. I was 20 years old when I got saved. I stood for me up to that point. But I remember taking a stand for the Lord Jesus, and it cost me friends. But I do not regret it because I have real friends now. And the truth of the matter is I would not be doing and would not have pastored for 42 years, started two Christian schools and organized a church on the eastern shore of Virginia and pastored Great Hope Baptist Church and salvaged a church in New Jersey if I had not stood up as a young Christian. Now, I was a man. I was 20 years old. But you can stand up for Jesus Christ in your youth. And you can stand up for Jesus Christ if you never have, even if you're an older person. Peer pressure makes you a slave to someone else's opinion. You are not free. Just remember that, young people. And let me share this with you. You will, the greatest friends you have and will have are probably not some of the kids you're going to school with. Just remember that. Just remember that. My best friends forsook me when I got saved because I wouldn't drink beer with them. I wouldn't run with them. I wouldn't go out and get in fights with them. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that anymore. So they forsook me, but they weren't real friends. Now I have real friends. And the truth of the matter is, 
if you don't stand up for the Lord in your youth, you'll miss out on something. And another thing, too, is if you do stand up in your youth, it'll be a lot easier when you get older. It, it really will. Because you will have learned the lesson that God blesses you when you take a stand. You see, Proverbs 1.10 is the first verse I taught my children. I have three adult children. They're all serving the Lord. One's a pastor. One's married to a missionary. One worked for Town Bank. The truth of the matter is, if sinners entice thee, consentest thou not. Proverbs 1.10. Young people, if sinners entice thee, consentest thou not. Nancy Reagan came out with her anti-drug message and said, just say no. Well, before she ever said, just say no, Solomon wrote, just say no to sin. Just say no. You don't have to feel good about it. Just say no. And I promise you, God will bless your life. That's a promise. I mean, it's a promise. God will bless your life. We have too many uh, people that are just milk toast riding the wave of Christianity. I'm not saying you should be arrogant. I'm not saying jump up on top of your desk at work and start uh, preaching. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying just don't listen to the dirty jokes. Just say, yeah, fellas, I'm not interested in that. Let me tell you a story about what it means to stand. This is a true story. There was a professor at the University of Southern California, USC, and he had a reputation. He was a deeply committed atheist, and his primary goal for one required class was to spend the entire semester attempting to prove that God couldn't exist. His students were always afraid to argue with him because of his impeccable logic. For 20 years, he had taught his class, and no one had ever had the courage to go against him. Sure, some had argued in the class at times, but no one ever really had gone against him. Nobody would go against him because he had a reputation. At the end of every semester on the last day, he would say to his class of 300 students, if there's anyone here who still believes in Jesus, stand up. In 20 years, no one had ever stood up. They knew what he was going to do next. He would say, because anyone who does believe in God is a fool. If God existed, he could stop this piece of chalk from hitting the ground and breaking. Such a simple task to prove that he is God, and yet he can't do it. And every year, he would drop the chalk onto the tile floor of the classroom, and it would shatter into 100 pieces. All of the students could do nothing but stop and stare. Most of the students were, were convinced that God couldn't exist. Certainly a number of Christians had slipped through, but for 20 years they had been too afraid to stand up. Well, a few years ago, and this was longer than a few years now, there was a freshman who happened to get enrolled in the class. He was a Christian and had heard the stories about this professor. He had to take the class because it was one of the, his required classes for his major, and he was afraid. But for three months that semester, he prayed every morning that he would have the courage to stand up no matter what the professor said or what the class thought. Nothing they said or did could ever shatter his faith, he hoped. Finally, the day came. The professor said, if there is anyone here who still believes in God, stand up. The professor and the class of 300 people looked at him shocked as he stood up at the back of the classroom. The professor shouted, you fool. If God existed, he could keep this piece of chalk from breaking when it hit the ground. He proceeded to drop the chalk, but as he did, it slipped out of his fingers, off his shirt cuff, onto the pleats of his pants, down his leg, and off his shoe. As it hit the ground, it simply rolled away, unbroken. The professor's jaw dropped as he stared at the chalk. He looked up at the young man and then ran out of the lecture hall. The young man who had stood up proceeded to walk to the front of the class 
and share his faith in Jesus for the next half hour. 300 students stayed and listened as he told of God's love for them and of his power through Jesus. A friend, that appeared to be an inconvenient time, but God intervened because this young Christian decided to stand. 20 years and the chalk broke, but because he stood up, the chalk didn't break. Is God waiting on you? You know, there's two sides to faith. I'm not a Calvinist. I don't believe God gives faith to some people and it doesn't give faith to others, so they're destined to go to hell. I don't believe that. Amen. That is a misrepresentation of God's love and his justice. But I do believe this. I believe we can't do anything without God. And if we do, it doesn't amount to anything. But I believe that God promises, man responds, and God provides in that order. Until you take a step of faith and stand up in some area of your life for testimony, don't expect God to work. Why should he? What's the point? Can God do anything? Yes. I do not know why God chose to use my mouth, my hand, my brain, my feet. I don't understand why he would use me. But in his economy and his sovereignty, he has chosen to use redeemed hunks of flesh like me who are not worthy. And he'll use you too if you stand up for Jesus. What does it mean? to stand up for Christ. That's what I want to talk about tonight. That passage says the word stand over and over. Stand therefore. Being dressed up like a Roman soldier. Every one of those pieces of armor have a, has a spiritual connotation. It does, well, I'm going to tell you what it means to stand for Jesus. Real simply, stand up where you are. We have too many one-day Christians. One day, I graduate from high school, I'm going to take a stand for Jesus. Once I get out of Bible college, once I get married, I'm going to stand up for Jesus. What do those events have to do with standing for Jesus? They have absolutely nothing to do with it. They have to do with the process of your life and God's will. Stand up in your home. Right. Obedience to parents. You obey your parents. Young people, if you don't obey your parents, you won't obey God. When I was a school administrator, I was in the office one day and a young girl was talking to her mother and I thought maybe she was talking to an enemy. And when she got off, I stood there. I waited until she got off. When she got off, I said, young man, young lady, let me tell you something. The way you were treating your mother is exactly the way you treat God. You see, our human relationships are a reflection of what we really believe and feel about our God. You can, you can say, well, if I wasn't married to this guy, I'd be a better Christian. Baloney. It may be easier. We want to, look, ever since the Garden of Eden, we've been blaming people, and we don't stand up on our, for our own uh, testimony. We try to pawn it off on somebody else. Standing up for Jesus means being a soldier and standing up and taking responsibility for who you are if you want to take the credit, you got to take the responsibility. Stand up where you are. Don't be a one day, one of these days I'm going to. No, you're not. It's kind of like people say, you know what? When I win the lottery, I'm going to tithe. Uh, first of all, you shouldn't play the lottery. It's a lack of faith. But if you won't give one penny out of every dime right now, what you're in the job you're working, don't expect to ever give 100000 out of a million. Doesn't that make sense? That is so clear. That's all God said, a penny out of every dime. And so stand up where you are. Don't put it off until adulthood, young people. I, I think one of the best verses on this thing of youth and time and faith is Ecclesiastes 12.1. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. I'm telling you, it doesn't get easier if you don't start when you're young. 
I've led some people that were in their 70s to Jesus Christ. That's a miracle. That's an absolute miracle. It's always a miracle, but it's easier to win a tender-hearted young junior-age boy or girl to Christ than it is to win a 70-year-old war uh, uh, warrior who's been uh, delving in sin all their life and rejecting the gospel. It's an absolute... Listen, I led uh, a man who was a former uh, uh, Green Beret who was a special forces who was in the tent offensive during the Vietnam crisis. Some of you probably remember that. And he lost a leg. And I'm sure this man had done some things in battle that he didn't think God could forgive him. He said, you know... And he would say that. He was like on the verge of getting saved. And, and I visited with him. We sent him one of our grow letters, and he came to our church. He got saved, and I baptized him. But before he got saved, I approached him about three times. One night, I was really burdened for him, and I told my, our outreach director, Brother uh, Hader, I said, I'm going to go see him. And I sat there, and I showed him how the apostle Paul had killed Christians. And he told me this story. He said, he'd always speak in the third person. He said, what if a guy on the battlefield had a buddy that got blown away right beside him? And he was begging you. You had to, you're going to have to leave him because you were right in the middle of combat. And you mercy killed him. He was going to die. He said, could God forgive that? And I showed how Paul had Stephen stoned. And I'm sure that's what he probably had to do. Could you imagine living with that? And when I got through telling him about the Apostle Paul stoning Stephen and how God used him to write 13 letters in the New Testament, how God made him the greatest church planner other than Jesus Christ in the New Testament, he, I looked at him, I said, Tom, I said, is there any reason why you can't get saved right now? And he talked about feel how it felt. And I said, there's no feeling before and he bowed his head and prayed and he wept this is a man's special forces and when he got through praying and asking Christ to save him I said well I'm going to ask you a question you asked about a feeling I said have you ever wept after you prayed he said I don't think I've ever prayed then I said now how am I going to baptize you with one leg he said you know I swim still I still swim the guy's tough He's in heaven now. He died at, at 79 years old. He, he, said, he said, I told my prosthesis doctor that I couldn't swim with this heavy leg that he made for me. And he said, I'll make you a plastic one. And he made him a plastic leg, and he put that plastic leg on, and I was able to baptize him. <laughs> I didn't lose him in the, in the water. And Tom's in heaven today. He died. I'm just saying, I'm just saying that uh, don't wait. Don't wait. Remember now, thy creator, in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, and the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. Standing for Jesus and standing up for Jesus means stand up where you are right now. Number two, it means standing in Christ's strength. Verse 10 says, be strong in the Lord. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Why? Because the forces of evil are overpowering. Verse 12 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And I believe there is some spiritual wickedness in Washington, D.C. and some other capitals of the world. I mean, the devil, listen, uh, the devil is the God of this world. Did you know that? This world system. He didn't create it, but he sure has infected it. Because the forces of evil are overpowering. You're no match for the devil. But, but God, but God. And the truth of the matter is, uh, there, there's nothing, there's nothing that Satan can do to you if you stand in the strength of Jesus Christ. But you don't have a chance if you don't. If you think you're capable and you're able and you think you've got enough college that you can think your way through it, you're in trouble. You're already in trouble. 
He has provided an arsenal of armor to protect you. You got a picture of a Roman soldier here. The reason Paul used the Roman soldier is because they were occupied by Roman soldiers. Everybody knew what a Roman soldier was. They knew what he looked like. They knew the armor that they carried on. So he took that armor of a Roman soldier, and they were, they were the best soldiers of that day. They were ruling the known world. So he said, I'm going to put a, and God used him to, 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 to compare the armor to spiritual uh, protection that we have as a Christian. You've got, uh, he says, take the whole armor. You don't go half prepared. And uh, stand there for having your loins girt about with truth. The loins was a girdle. The girdle was the centerpiece where all of the other armor connected, except for the sword, which was the only offensive weapon. It was, it was central. And folks, uh, you, sh- you shall hear the truth and the truth shall set you free. Jesus said, my word is truth. And uh, we have the truth of, uh, from God Almighty. We have the mind of God in this book. I believe this is the inspired word of God. If I didn't, I'd be the biggest fool that ever lived. I mean, I've been preaching it for 45 years. And the truth of the matter is I've seen it change people's lives. I saw it change my life. You know the difference between John Godfrey Sr. today, 52 years later, and as a 20-year-old man at 421 Forest Road, Chesapeake, Virginia, bowing beside his bed and asking Christ to save him. You know the difference? The difference is how much of this book has been appropriated in my heart and life. This will change you. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. It works for the young and the old. But you got to hear it. You got to heed it. You've got to read it. And so you must put it on. <laughs> now, here's another thing. If you look at this passage, God doesn't put it on for you. I mean, I'll never forget, I made first string football. Uh, in the eighth grade, and I didn't even know how to put the uniform on, but I knew how to tackle Clifton Stewart, who lived down the street, who played for the University of Tennessee, and he was twice as big as me. So I wasn't smart enough. I was like a bumblebee. I just figured I could knock down anything that came by. And I wasn't very big, but I didn't mind putting my head in it. Most junior high kids are turning and run from the running back. And they put me out there one day, and I knocked down everything that came at me. And they said, what's your name, son? (laughs) I was a no-name. In three days, they said, can you catch a football? I said, I sure can can you block? I said, yeah. And he said, we know you can tackle. And the truth of the matter is, I didn't even know how to put the uniform on. It took me forever to get the thing all, I didn't have, I never had a football unit. We always played uh, 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 football without a uniform on, you know, sandlot football, you know. So that was the beginning for me. I did learn how to put it on after a while. But the truth of the matter is, you got, God doesn't say, now I'm going to put this armor on you. He gives you an arsenal and he's given you all things that you need for godliness. And he says, put it on. You know the problem most Christians, they don't know how to dress themselves spiritually. They don't know how to dress themselves. So you've got the girdle of truth. You've got the breastplate of righteousness. You have your feet shod with the preparation of gospel peace. The hobnail boots the soldiers had had cleats in them. That was to hold ground so they wouldn't give ground when they were in a battle. And by the way, folks, we need to take ground. The only way we do that is win souls with the gospel. We take ground. Take ground. And then you've got the, uh, above all, the shield of faith. Now, it covered all of the rest of the armor. You might divert the darts, fiery darts of the wicked one. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You hold that shield of faith out there. Keeps you going. It protects the whole body. And then, of course, you've got the helmet of salvation, which protects the head. 
and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So we have been given an arsenal of equipment that we use it. Now, folks, we have the Word of God. What are you doing with it? You really believe we're going to turn America around just by voting? I mean, come on. Blessed is a nation whose God is the Lord. This is not a Christian nation. By the way, do you know that it's been uh, declared legally? The Supreme Court has said that this is a Christian nation. They don't talk about that, do they? I forget exactly when they did. It certainly wasn't last week. The Supreme Court declared America a Christian nation. It's not a Muslim nation. It's not a cult nation. Now, I believe in freedom. I believe in freedom to go to hell if you want to. But the bottom line is we have been given, we have been given a, a tremendous, tremendous experiment here. And our forefathers had it right, man. Where did, where did they get that wisdom from, man? Unbelievable. And I'll tell you what, you can, you can believe that God wanted, I mean, you can believe that we have this nation because of capitalism. No, we have capitalism because God knows the right, the, that if a man works and makes a profit, he ought to be able to reap that profit. And if he, if he does well, he'll give somebody else a job. God knows all about capitalism. But I'll tell you why America was founded. Because America has sent and we'll send more missionaries, probably 95% of all the missionaries that are sent into the world and probably 95% of all missions dollars come from America. You want to know why we have an economic system like we do that they're trying to destroy? Because God has blessed it for a spiritual reason. That's why America is so great. And folks, socialism has never worked. Do you realize that the 59% of the Democrats, you may be a Democrat, I'm a Baptist. <laughs> uh, uh, you may be a Republican. Uh, you know, you know I, I don't have a whole lot of faith in human nature, regardless of the title, but I'm going to tell you this. 59% uh, of the Democrats believe socialism is okay. I just read that today. They believe so. It's never worked anywhere. You know what it is? It's a government. The government don't make money. They take money. If you have a business, you're the one who makes it. It's crazy. It doesn't make a bit of sense. God intends for man to work. If a man don't work, he ought not eat. So much for welfare. I'm, I'm for all for welfare for people who really need it. But people that just don't want to work. I think, you ought to, I think you ought to say, you don't work, you don't eat. I promise you there's all kinds of jobs out there and nobody's taking them. You know why? Because the government's paying them not to work. Amen. Paying people to have babies. Yeah. It's absolutely nuts. But it gets votes from the simple-minded people of this world. It's crazy. Anyway, I didn't need to get on that. Listen. You must put it on. God's not going to put it on for you. He's done it all for you. He's provided it. it. Takes faith. Your side. Put it on. And then number three. This is tough. You need to stand alone if necessary. Now there's the kicker. Nobody wants to stand alone. They want a crowd. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Here we have the Apostle Paul. Man, he's got an eye disease. He's a little fella. He's not big. He can't see very well. He has to get other people to write things for him on the inspiration. He's not treated very well by the Jews or the Gentiles. He was stoned at Lystra and left for dead. Most people would be ready to quit. Why is God letting this happen to me? No, he didn't do that. Look at chapter 4. And boy, I'm telling you, he was a preacher. He named names. <laughs> he, look at verse 14. He says, Alexander the Copper Smith did me much evil. This is 2 Timothy 4. 
Alexander the coversmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works, of whom be thou aware also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. And look at verse 16. At my first answer, that's his first trial, no man stood with me. But all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, hey, get it, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me that by me the preaching might be fully known and that all the Gentiles might hear and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Wow. He stood alone. But he wasn't alone. I remember, I remember the first time I ever stood up for Christ. I got saved in November, finished the year, went home. I got saved in November on Thanksgiving vacation from East Tennessee State. I went back to school, finished the year out, didn't learn a whole lot, tried to read my Bible. That summer read through my Bible. Went back to East Tennessee State. I was in a family health class. I had a, I was wanting to be a coach, uh, health and physical education, and he had to take a family health. And in the family health class, there was an old maid teacher there. She'd never been married, but I think she was a Christian. You know, the Bible Belt in Tennessee, you got that that, that does happen. And uh, she was, uh, uh, she was in the class there. And one part of the family health was religion. And when they got to that they began to attack marriage. And I was in a class there just keeping, minding my own business, and there's a bunch of hippies in the back saying, we don't need it anymore. And and they began to rile me up. Because I'd already learned that God is the one who designed marriage in the book of Genesis chapter 2. They told told Adam, it's not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helpmeet. Then he He operated on Adam. By the way, in my marriage council, if we required a young man to shed blood before he ever said, I do, I think maybe we'd have more commitment out of the men. (laughs) The first one started with, he had the first anesthesiology. God put him to sleep. He did it while he was asleep. And then he he took a rib. Now he's lacking. Okay? And until he gets that rib back, he's not whole. You know, the Indians say, man without squall, half man. There's a lot of truth in that. And he didn't take from his head uh, so that she would rule over him or from his foot that he should trample on her. But he took from the side because a rib is support for your vital organs and she's caught alongside. It's a partnership. Okay. B.R. Lagan said that uh, Adam provided the first spare parts for the loudspeaker, first loudspeaker. Now I made all the women mad, so you won't listen to me anymore. But anyway, that's just a joke. Some of you just got it. Look, just explain it to your husband when you get home. He'll get it. Ah, just laugh now. Nobody knows that you don't know what's going on. But anyway, yeah. sometimes you just have to laugh at the crowd saying, what is he talking about? Uh, stand alone and necessary. I'll never forget. I, I don't know why I did this. I can't even remember. I didn't even think it through. I just stood up. And I said, Listen, marriage was God's idea, the book of Genesis, the Bible. I said, if you start chipping away at the first institution, not the church, marriage was before the church. And by the way, the reason we have dysfunctional churches, we have dysfunctional homes and marriages. And what happened was, I said, before long, institutions like government will crumble if you destroy the home in marriage. And I said, the Bible defines marriage and God, it's God's idea. And some big old guy over here, big old chunky guy, he said, what's the Bible? And I said, it's the word of God. Now this was not in a Sunday school class, folks. This was in a secular college. And they laughed him to scorn. And it's the first time I realized that if I stood up for Jesus in an inconvenient time, that God would stand up for me. And they laughed him to scorn because I said, it's the word of God. And he shut up. I'll never forget that. And you know what? In that class, and I didn't know much about the Bible that time. I was just a year old Lord. I became the authority. 
There was one guy, he had a, they had a panel and he had to discuss marriage. It was his topic. And they were up at the table. He said, now Godfrey, help me out. He wanted me to keep the discussion going. I said, I'll do what I can. And he, and he made this foolish statement. Now, this is not representative of all Catholics, okay? But he said, well, I was raised Catholic. He said, and just because I don't believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, he said, I don't believe I'm going to go to hell. And I said, well, you're wrong. And they laughed him to scorn. And I, he didn't ask me a question. I don't think I helped him. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the teacher, she said, Godfrey, what do you think? I said, Man, I don't know anything. What do you mean? What are you asking me for? Just because I stood up for Jesus for marriage and didn't even know really how to defend it biblically. Didn't have all the knowledge I've got now. I do family conferences and couples retreats and I just did a family revival in Georgia. I, I, I know a whole lot more now about it. I've been married for 46 years. I've, I've learned my experience too. You know, uh, uh, Hope's taught me a lot. And uh, the bottom line is, is that I became the authority in the class and I was no authority just because I stood up for Jesus. Absolutely amazing. There were three guys that stood up for Jesus when Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 3 of Daniel, he said, I'm going to give you boys another chance. He said, I know you didn't stand up. Shadrach, Meshach, and a little bungalow. Uh, he... <laughs> <laughs> Daniel chapter 3 you have the most non-political statement made to an authority to a king or an emperor in, in history and the three Hebrew children Nebuchadnezzar liked them they were helping his administration he didn't want them to burn and so Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 3 of Daniel verse 14 notice what he says Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now if ye be ready that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flutes, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, when the band strikes the tune, Ye fall down and worship the image which I have made well. But if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning fire furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? He challenged the true God when he did that. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. That cuts out a lot of Democrats and Republicans, doesn't it? <laughs> if it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up he said, we'd rather die than worship your idol as a reproach to our God. They wouldn't bend, they wouldn't bow, and they wouldn't burn. Amen. You know, there's some things that I'd like to see a video replay. And one of them is Nebuchadnezzar's face. When he looks down, to, by the way, they heated it up seven times and the men who threw them in, they tied them up and threw them in. They were slain by the fire. So it was a hot fire. I mean, you could pop popcorn in this thing. And they threw him in, and Nebuchadnezzar, after it calmed down a little bit, he happened to look over into the furnace. He said, you know, he didn't go to Christian school, so he couldn't count past three. He said, didn't we throw three in there? He said, but I see four. He said, they're loosed and walking in the flames, and one looks like the Son of God. Now, who told him that? I want, I want to see his expression. And he brought them out. Now he said, if nobody worships your God, we're going to make their house like a dunghill, man. He, he was a total extremist. Went the other way. He said, we're going to kill them because it scared him because he ain't never experienced anything like that before. Folks, it means standing up where you are. Are you standing up where you are? It means standing in Christ's strength. You're not. You don't have the strength to stand up for Christ in some situations. 
But you won't stand alone if you stand up for Jesus. It means standing alone if necessary. But number four, and this is really important, it means standing back up when you get knocked down. It ought to be like a basketball. When you hit bottom, you ought to bounce up. In the late 1800s, John O. Sullivan was the boxing champ of the world. It was back when they did bare-fisted boxing. Many states outlawed it because of it. He was known as the Boston bad boy. He weighed 225 pounds. He knocked out 47 men. That's back when you fought until somebody either died or got knocked out or quit. There was no 10-round, 15-round limit. And he was the man. Everybody wanted to challenge John O. Sullivan because he was the bad boy of Boston. There was another man who was about 185 pounds named, uh, named James Corbett. He was a banker. And he got into boxing, but he decided that it was foolish to stand jaw to jaw and toe to toe and beat each other to death. And about that time, the gloves were coming in. And he didn't want to have to go through the process to get to Sullivan by b trying to beat up and have himself get beat up by fighting about 10 fights and winning them. So he decided to go to another country, Australia, and he fought the... the um, the champ of Australia. That, he was the one, he was the first one, James Corbett, uh, learned to do the dance around, you know, and move, jab, and wear your opponent out. And that was a technical fighter, not just a raw bone, knock down, drag out. And that's what Sullivan was used to. Well, Corbett went and fought the champ in Australia. It went for 60 rounds they finally called it a draw. But because he stayed in the ring that long with a champ, he automatically was given an opportunity to fight John O'Sullivan. And he fought John O'Sullivan and it went 21 rounds and he wore John Sullivan. John Sullivan, he's not a guy out in the first two rounds. I mean, it, it, he didn't know what it was to go 15, 20 rounds because he just knocked people out. And, he, and, you know, Corbett did get knocked down in the fight, but he got back up. And he outlasted O'Sullivan and finally knocked him out. Well, the, the, the commentators were just overwhelmed because nobody could ever, he had never lost a fight, 47 in a row. And number 48, he gets knocked out by this smaller man who's a technical fighter. And they came to him and they interviewed him and said, how did you defeat John O'Sullivan? Real simple answer. I decided to fight another round. Standing up for Jesus, you're going to get knocked down. You're going to be hit hard and defeated to some degree. You need to stand back up. Because he is worthy. He is worthy. Just fight another round. Can't beat somebody that will fight another round. And I promise you, if you'll get back up when you get knocked down, you'll find out that Jesus is standing there right beside you. And you'll find that his strength has not abated one bit. But he will test your resolve. Let's pray. Stand up. Stand up for Jesus. Ye soldiers of the cross, lift high his royal banner. He must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall he lead, till every foe is vanquished, and Christ is Lord indeed. We sing that. Are we standing up for Jesus? Would you stand with me right now? Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. As the instrument plays, what is your standing in Christ? It's a preacher. I need, to, I need to be just a little bit more aggressive for my Lord. I at least need to not keep silent when I need to speak. And when you impress on my heart to tell someone about Jesus, 
I need to tell them. I need to pass out that track and break that ice where I have fear. You know what kills fear? Action kills fear. Fear is just a state of mind that has no meaning until there's a threat. But we fear when there's no threat. Folks, if we're going to save the church, if we're going to save the home, and if you're eventually going to save this country, it's not going to be because we have guns. There's only one thing worse than freedom of speech, having freedom of speech, and we're silent. Jim's going to sing a verse. If you need to come, why don't you come?